Thank you for joining. Um, today's talk, we're going to uh, we're going to meet uh, some dear friends, uh, Daniela, Luca, and Pedro, uh, who will tell us about Rise International, uh, the NGO they founded, and uh, their model of sustainable development. Um, they come from uh, different backgrounds. Daniela Guzman is the founder and ex executive director, uh, comes from business development and marketing. Uh, Luca Storri is the co-founder and director of uh, the In Loco program, together with Pedro. Um, I think I'll leave it to them to, uh, to tell us more and expand about uh, their experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Daniela, and I'm the co-founder of RISE. And we're going to take you on a little bit of a journey today. So I hope you're, you're ready to um, buckle up and go all the way down to the very, very southern, southern tip of Africa. How many of you have been to Africa? Okay, excellent. How many of you have heard of Lesotho? Okay, numbers go down. Okay, what, what have you heard of Lesotho? Always curious to know, what do you know about Lesotho? Anything? Just heard of it. Okay, most people think it's pronounced Lesotho, but the letter U doesn't exist in the, le in the alphabet, so an O um, is pronounced like uh, a U. So it's in that very, I don't know if the pointer is working here, but it's in that very, very bottom part of, um, of Africa. How many countries are there in Africa? <laughs> Shout out. Don't be shy, I guess. 35. 35. Pardon? 55, almost. Uh, 54, yes. Yeah. So we have a tendency of talking about Africa as one continent. It's a vast, vast continent. Lots of different cultures, um, lots of different geographies, lots of different cultures and people. So in southern Africa, inside South Africa, there is this kingdom called Lesotho, which got its independence. You can't see the numbers there, but all these countries got their independence mainly in the 60s, Lesotho in 1966, so fairly young uh, countries, young economies. And they're, of course, growing at a massive rate. You know, Africa as a continent is the fastest growing continent in the world. And by 2050, will have almost doubled with 2.4, uh, sorry, 2.5 billion people. And it's got a very, very young population. The, the median is under 20 uh, years of age. So it's a fantastic opportunity, right? But the challenge is the level of unemployment. A third of the youth are unemployed, and that means that's 280 million people who are unemployed. And this is a, you know, a challenge that we cannot uh, ignore that's affecting all of us. We know the amount of economic refugees that there are, and there's necessity for us to work together to address the challenges. Um, there's also an amazing opportunity because with growing populations, we need a lot of infrastructure development. Look at some of those numbers. We need to build 403 million homes and 3 million hospital beds and hundreds and thousands of schools and water, energy, rail and road and so on. And that's where the built environment comes in because there's a great opportunity for both skilled and unskilled labor. And in developing countries like the one we're gonna be talking about today, Lesotho, which I've had the pleasure of um, living there. I first got there in 2009, uh, where half the population lives below the poverty line. So that's less than $2 a day. And there's a lot of people who can't go to school. There's a 74% dropout rate from primary to secondary school because secondary schools are not free, so most people um, can't get to school. So the built environment offers this wonderful uh, job creation opportunity. Um, this just gives you an indicator of the te top 10 investor economies in, um, in Africa. Those are numbers in um, billions of dollars. Again, you can't see, but the UK is, is number one there, 65 billion in 2020. Um, we can send you a copy of this presentation, but you've got the UK, France, Netherlands, United States, China, Italy, South Africa, Singapore, Switzerland, and India. And there's a comparison from 2016 in orange and 2020 in, in green, but they've uh, all pretty much gone up except for South Africa and their investment. 
And this is a, a quote um, from Alicia Garcia saying, it seems clear that without job creation, foreign direct investment into Africa might not be sustainable down the road given the continent's population dynamics. And that is the reality that we're living in. It's not sustainable and it's also um, not dignified development. Um, so something needs to change. This is a statistic I came across in 2016, um, which shocked me and was the catalyst for me then reaching out um, and speaking to, to Pedro and, and Luca and how RISE came about. When I discovered that 90% of social impact investing goes to foreign entrepreneurs in Africa rather than local entrepreneurs, I just thought that was absolutely wrong. And the work we do at RISE is all about trying to shift that statistic and increase it the other way around. I come from a private sector background, as Pierre told you at the beginning. So when I first got to Africa, I had my whole background was in sales and marketing and setting up businesses and startups and so on. And I got introduced into the not-for-profit sector, um, working for a wonderful um, NGO called Kick for Life. Um, and we did a lot of um, sport for social change. But I started to understand the dynamics in which um, not-for-profits operate. And some of the things just didn't quite make sense. Um, that the reliance on donor funding makes it very high risk. If that donor changes their mind or stops funding, then your future is compromised. The fact that it's um, donor driven, so a lot of decisions and grants that are published are based on decision makers in Geneva, London, Paris, New York, some of whom have never even been to Africa, deciding on where millions, if not billions of dollars or euros are spent. Um, and um, organizations have to pivot according to where the, that funding is coming from. And it reminded me of, you know, Henry Ford saying, um, you can have any color car as long as it's black. Um, so it, it prevents organizations from actually responding to the local community's needs and actually responding to, to donors' demands um, and producing fancy reports saying things are, are working when they're not necessarily working to please the donor and not being able to be responsive. Another challenge, most not-for-profits only have enough cash for about three months, so it makes long-term planning also very challenging and very stressful. And most of these grants that come out are typically for 12 months. Well, development takes time, so you're kind of designing programs that kind of have this artificial timeline of, of 12 months, and uh, that was also very challenging. And there's this habit in the not-for-profit sector to look at being very sector-specific. Are you in education? Are you in nutrition? Are you in um, wash, the, the water and sanitation sector? Well, life doesn't really work that way, right? If you have a child who is not getting a nutritious meal, how do you expect them to concentrate at school and have access to a good education? So there's a lack also of this... Um, holistic sort of approach when coming to development. So that is when my life changed. In 2009, when I was working for this not-for-profit, Kick for Life, working in football in 2010. Do you remember any soccer fans out here, football fans? What was there in 2010? World Cup, World Cup in South Africa, exactly, yes. And FIFA had the big social responsibility program there called Football for Hope Centers. They built um, 20 centers, 15 in different African countries. Um, anyway, th that's a long story, but I'll keep it short. But thanks to that project, I was able to discover social enterprise. Any of you heard about social enterprise in this room? No. Ah, your lives are going to change. This is so exciting. So social enterprise is that beautiful sweet spot in between. Um, complete traditional charities where you basically got money coming in and it's spent. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's one way cash flow and all the challenges that comes with that I just talked about now. And then you've got for profit where your main objective is to create profit, to be efficient, effective, and then that profit goes into um, shareholders um, or directors of a company. Social enterprise is a bit of both. So you have to offer a product or a service that people are willing to pay for. So you have to be efficient, effective, um, relevant. 
Um, but the profits, it's called surplus, is generated back into the social impact or environmental projects that you're working in. So it totally makes sense. It means you have to be relevant. It means you have to be efficient and effective and, and constantly evolve and be completely 100% market driven. So that's what we went on to um, set up RISE. Um, we started in 2017. We just celebrated our fifth birthday in November. And at the end, we're going to show, share with you a brief video to give you a sort of a summary of what we've been doing for the last five years. Um, but RISE um, is actually the last four letters of the word enterprise. And it's also an acronym that stands for Relationships Inspiring Social Enterprise, because that's what we're all about. We're about being connectors and seeing how we can add value um, to vulnerable communities and build on skills that are already there and empowering local communities. So we're all about technical skills in, in design and construction, um, building a network of professionals, and also community development. And um, entrepreneurial skills also is, is hugely important in everything that we do. So our model is kind of a, a two-way. It's, it's where young people in the built environment, so people who've studied architecture, engineering, bricklaying, electrical installation, and so forth, desperate for work because they can't find work. We've got massive uh, unemployment um, problem in Lesotho, the same as the rest of Africa. Um, and vulnerable communities who need infrastructure development. So we match that uh, need um, and we have a win-win where the communities get the much needed infrastructure and the fellows get the much needed work experience. And that's where we developed after one year of us being on Skype calls, it was in those days, we didn't have Zoom, um, basically brainstorming how we can make this model work. And we went out and tested in Lesotho in 20, 2017. Um, and we've been developing our curriculum over the years and we're sort of now getting ready to, to hopefully scale it. But my colleagues will tell you a bit more about our in loco program and some of the projects we've been working on. So I'm going to hand over now to Pedro, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Pedro Clark. I'm an architect. I'm one of the two architects that co-founded uh, In Loco with Daniela. And it's kind of a, a funny and a strange story for me, and it's interesting to come back here. So in 2007, I was thinking about uh, what I wanted to do with my life. I just finished architecture school, and I had to go and build, well, I felt I had to go and build something. But no one in Europe would allow me to build anything without being fully trained and doing my part three so I started applying to loads of different countries, and I found myself in Lesotho in 2007. I won't tell you through what happened then, but I met Danielle in 2009. We did the first project together, and then we sort of fast track uh, to 2016, and we're thinking about what to do. And I'd met Luca by then, working in sort of slum rehabilitation programs in, in Portugal. Um, there are still a lot of slums in Europe. We probably don't look at them, but they are. And, um, and we were looking at what we were doing, and we were thinking of testing this model and in loco and what it could be. And we, we were going to do it initially in Uganda, and then for a series of reasons, complication, difficulty, our networks, uh, we decided to actually shift away from Uganda and move to Lesotho. And Lesotho, as Daniela has explained, is that tiny little country there at the bottom. And it's a country that's got two of the most bizarre geographical facts. It's the... I call it the only, but people generally call it one of three only singly landlocked countries in the world, and the other two being San Marino and the Vatican, so not particularly amazing big countries with huge economies. But uh, Lesotho, because of that, is totally dependent on South Africa. It's a country where when South Africa needs labor, they open the border and they allow people in. When South Africa doesn't need labor, like it happened after 2010 for the World Cup, they shut the borders and it make it really difficult to come across. Uh, a lot of the people in Lesotho, the men in particular, started moving and going to work in the mines, and that led to a few problems we'll see in a second. And then the other really amazing fact, it's, it's the country with the highest, lowest point on Earth. So the whole country is sited above 1,400 meters of altitude. In fact, 1,460 meters of altitude. And that totally shifts your idea of Africa. So if you think of Africa, you're thinking savanna. When we're talking about Lesotho, we're talking about snow. And this doesn't stay, it, it doesn't sit on the ground for a long period of time, but it is the one country in Southern Africa and probably most of Africa where you can actually ski. It's got a ski resort, a lot of South Africans rich go there. Um, and then the architecture is just your typical mud, ha mud houses, uh, stone thatch buildings. They're, they're beautiful buildings. Uh, a lot of them take on these decorative patterns, uh, detema. 
And then there's a colonial period that started when uh, King Mishwishwi the first moved in, which also made it for a very interesting thing because he, he managed somehow to mix uh, both the French missionaries who came and educated his children and created schools with uh, a request to Queen Victoria to become a protectorate. So somehow that worked and it avoided going into a series of wars, uh, which made Lesotho grow in a very sort of peaceful way. So the Marija uh, hub is a place where we work and there's a lot of different sort of beautiful vernacular and natural materials that we can learn from. But then the outskirts of Maseru look like many other sort of uh, sprawling African towns where it's sort of ongoing cinder blocks and metal tin roof structures that just spread on for, for kilometers and kilometers. Um, then a few years ago, something happened, which was a big uh, Malaysian university came in, part privately funded but government sponsored, and they are the Limconqua University. And you can see there, they started running um, a course. There was already an architectural course at the time, and that architectural course was at the Polytechnic, but it was a more technical course. And this one was more design focused, and it's kind of like the reality and the dream, you know. They're teaching young uh, Basuto architects to build trying to teach buildings that maybe people in this office would aspire to build as well. But their reality is completely different. It's more what we see at the bottom of this photo. So the mismatch between these things is, is kind of quite impressive. And that's where we came in, sort of having been working in Lesotho since 2007, thinking, look, how can we do things a little bit differently? It's important to remember that 30% of the population is unemployed. And of that, you know, 60% has the age between 25 and 30. So we have huge amounts of youth unemployment. And those are the guys that we really try and work with because we think that by creating new jobs and by training them to be their own job creators, we're going to be able to potentialize and change the market and start seeing the infrastructure development that is needed. Uh, Luca and I, I need to get it closer, sorry. Um, Luca and I have been in... Um, working in development for a long time and it's not because we don't love going overseas and doing these projects ourselves but in the long term that's not very sustainable so we kind of shifted the model between designing buildings to starting to design a program and a curriculum that allows people to do and learn how to do the things that we love to do in a sort of more sustainable and consistent way so that came about uh, and we created uh, in loco and loco the first time we ran it uh, was uh, 2018 and the idea was to create like this international but local community of people that are interested in um, designing and building as a way forwards and as a way of creating things that will last and stand the test of time. Our first project was uh, totally self-funded, um, huge sacrifice from the founder. Um, and we, we went through this to essentially locate a community that needed needs, uh, that needed uh, infrastructure. And we chose uh, an orphanage. 23% um, of the Lesotho population is infected uh, with HIV and AIDS. And that's led to a huge amount of orphans, um, either double or single orphans. And a lot of them live in conditions being held um, that are not ideal. And in this case, we're talking about an orphanage that was sitting on the outskirts of Maseru, probably about 30 minutes away from the capital. And they were not living in conditions that were very suitable for the amount of people that were there. And they had kids all the way down from the age of three uh, to 17. And then sometimes they had youth, they, they call them youth from 17 to 21, still living on these premises. So in collaboration and in participation with them, we, set, we went through a series of participatory design workshops and discussing with them, look, we want to do something, we want to test this uh, educational model for, for, for people in the built environment, and we need a partner, and what can you guys, what do you really need? Like, how can we, if we're going to spend money here, how can we invest it, and how can we make it so that your lives become better? And the discussion was about, look, do we move everybody out? Do we just move some of the people out? And the, at the end, what they sort of decided was, if we do a halfway house, sort of a place where the younger kids can start to live more independently, that would be the best way to go forward. So we started planning for this, um, what we call the JLC2, which was a center where some of the kids that had been staying in with the, with the care mothers and with the fully supported uh, people at the main orphanage would move along and start living semi-independently. And with that, we planned a series of um, income generating activities. So not only is RISE a social enterprise, but we promote that our partners start 
start to develop social enterprises so that it makes these places uh, more self-sufficient. Um, this is from photos from the participatory workshop and who, the people you see presenting were the first uh, fellows from the first cohort. So they didn't know what they were getting into. They had just met us. Uh, we were kind of just presenting this idea. We didn't fully know how it was going to work out. We had to build relationships with the universities. We had to build relationships with trade, with the industry. And we ended up hiring uh, a construction manager from an experienced construction firm to, uh, to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the construction site. And then every single position on a normal design and construction project is replicated by the, the fellows. So we allocate people uh, to be the design architects, then we allocate them to be the site architects, then we allocate one of the guys that uh, has been the site architect to become the site manager, and everything is on a rotational basis so that everybody has this experience. And this was the idea behind what we've now formalized as a curriculum to give you an experience as you come out of university, be it or a polytechnic as a bricklayer or as an architect or as an engineer, that you understand that these things are done collaboratively, collaboratively and together and we can grow and do it. So Luca and I were there a lot that year as well, uh, physically building and showing people that we can get our hands dirty to do these things. And it, it was a valuable learning experience for everybody. This was the building, just a very quick note on it. It's divided into two parts, sleeping quarters to the right, I think from what you're seeing, and then the living, the sort of day-to-day uh, -day management, cooking, kitchen area to the left. Um, this was the site we got. Uh, it's um, up-and-coming sort of neighborhood. Uh, the roads were being built. There's no roads. There's still no roads today. <clears throat> and that's what it was like when we finished. So this relatively delicate uh, modernist structure sitting in the center. But we didn't necessarily impose that design. That design was derived between Luke and myself and the local crew of young architects that had just graduated. Um, when we came around to using materials and figuring out what we could build, there wasn't much that was sort of very inspiring. There were a lot of uh, concrete blocks that we could just buy off the shelf, and there was sort of stone that we couldn't source reasonably for this place. So we started looking around, and we saw that there were these very low-cost, locally-made bricks just on the side of the road. So we started to um, negotiate with them and then test and had a lot of bricks made, and we brought these onto site. But we didn't just want to do a simple brick building that everybody could, could just look at and say, look, this is just another building. Um, we then sort of collaborated and, and looked into one of the most beautiful patterns or one of the most beautiful decorative styles of Lesotho, which is Litema. And it's essentially a, a technique in which people design and draw um, which essentially lines that represent, and each one of them have different themes, families. It's not like Scottish tartan patterns, but it, it has something to do with traditions and where people come from. And I'd researched some of this earlier on when I was doing my dissertation. So we looked into that and looked into bricks and starting to come up with, you know, something a bit of inspired by Alvaralto as well. How can we use the bricks to replicate some of that? And it was interesting because some of the guys locally had never thought that, you know, a brick wall is a brick wall. So these young guys out of university were learning just that a brick wall doesn't have to be a brick wall. And you can actually use the idea of using a brick wall to make something quite special. So the process went on. It took about six to eight months to build. Um, we were looking to do it in six. It took eight. And all these guys that you see in the photos, they're, they're not professional bricklayers. They're not professional uh, skilled labor, they, they never probably dirtied their hands on a construction site. So they were young architects and young builders, as we've said. They went through. We did some stress testing because we didn't have huge structural engineers involved, so some of the uh, trial and error to get things done. And then at during points, because Luca and I both run practices here in Europe, we couldn't be there on a day-to-day -day basis, so we moved some of this to remote. And after the pandemic, for us, it was kind of like plain sailing because we've been doing that for a long time. Um, receiving stuff back in Europe, marking it up, discussing with whoever we'd appointed as local you know, site architect for that week or those two weeks, and getting the process just a, an iterative design process constantly. Um, at the end, it's a building that we're, you know, it's not going to win a Pritzker, but it's a building that we're quite proud of. Uh, it's quite interesting. The patterns work and the social enterprises that were sort of put in place. We brought in containers to run a tuck shop and a computer lab that was funded by some people in Malta. And that's the team or some of the crew uh, with Lucas sitting on top of the container close to the final stages. At the end, when you look at it, you look at and you see this, which was one of the businesses that was set up there in the community to run and help make the place more, more sustainable.
Uh, that's the other side of it, so how it feels a few years later. And I'll pass on to Luca for some of the other community projects we've been doing after. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, I'm the only one without British accent here. <laughs> so, so as you can see, I will show you other couple of projects really quickly, uh, just to show the average where of so the environment where we work with. As you can see, is actually not in the outskirts, but it's in the high mountains. So it's a village, remote village. It's one hour walk or one hour and a half walk from the roads. As in on top, it's about 200, 200 meters of um, uh, sea level. So this is the road to arrive then next to the kind of plateau on the, in the corner. So the, the, um, the village is separate for the rest of the road for, let's say, the network of possible development by the river, but also it's very, very far from schools, from uh, the markets and so on. So there was this, uh, as Daniela said before, the challenges are not coming separately, but actually uh, the fact that they are far from school, the, the kids need to walk um, more than two hours to go to school and the girls especially run the risk or actually they get abused uh, by the herd boy on the way to school. So there was two actually options. So actually, so the family took out the girls from school because this risk. So the option or actually the fund that we have is for, or we build a school to the, in the village, but then means that we need to bring the teachers from the villages or that we can run, sorry, that we can build a bridge to cut out uh, the long um, trail to or hike to the schools. And then we've been there um, in the village. We spent two days there. They actually uh, cleaned the main square, let's say, and we, we slept there. Um, and the next day we run what we usually do. So it's a participatory design workshop. It was not designed, but it was a participatory uh, moment where we ask to the villages. So actually there was quite empty at a certain point, like 50, 60 person came along from everywhere. And they were sit like men from one side, uh, lady from the others. And we explain the idea. So what you want to do, you want to design or build the schools or, or the, the bridge. Actually the bridge was the, the final decision also because with that, the the kids can go faster to school, but also can bring new, I mean, create new networks with the markets and with the, 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 um, the agriculture and the food aid products to be sold. But also uh, the river during the winter season when the, or rainy season actually becomes impossible to cross. So we decided to create, the, to build the bridge, but of course we desire, with the, our desire was to, to collaborate with the community also because the it's really remote but also because if you involve the community then they they get, take care of it i mean they start uh, have a feeling of belonging and also the budget didn't allow us to build in one shot all together so we basically divide the project in three phases. where the first phase for them was to collect i don't remember 380 wheelbarrows of stones then we build the two uh, foundation and the walls for the, um, uh, for the bridge. And then the final phase was to bring the pieces of iron, of steel um, on site and to bring together. And that's uh, how we build it. And it was actually really interesting because actually the, the, the bridge was founded by a huge contractor, builders uh, from Malta. The, construction site manager was one of the guys that used to work for GLC. So he did the first fellowship. So it was a, uh, a, fel a fellows and we hired him to became the construction manager. Then the company that also sent like five guys to five laborers uh, to work here to weld the pieces of, um, of the bridge. Anyway, it's 18 meters span. It's not the Pritzker price, but it's also interesting uh, and quite challenging to do it in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we divide in six pieces. But anyway, then the, the, the company hire 
our fellows and now finally after the pandemic it just starts to work in Malta for the next couple of years so he gets hired from the company and this was 2019 so actually this is the kind of our dream came through quite fast um, and then the other uh, project that we did again in another kind of environment before was in an outskirt of uh, the city of the capital so in a kind of a periphery anyway urban area then in the mountain and this is in the agricultural land outside the city it's about 40 minutes out we cannot build any permanent building here for regulation it's just for agriculture so we decide to use the timber structure that is not really common in um, in uh, Lesotho as a, as a material for construction um, but allows us to build a temporary building and of course we start to doing a participatory design workshop the center is for people with um, intellectual disabilities as you imagine like in Africa anyway well, here if if you have um, intellectual disabilities you might not probably um, I mean um, <clears throat> past the illness but in a way you have a society a welfare system that helps you a lot with the kids and here actually it's quite difficult to have it and the family it's also difficult to recognize if your kids has a intellectual disability so they get um, isolated and more and more so the, the association of the family sorry the families with kids with uh, intellectual disability create these associations and so we did a participatory design workshop with all of them. As we usually do, we, we divide it in groups like staff, uh, managers, but also the kids of the GS of the orphanage in this case, also with the kids, uh, with people with intellectual disabilities to understand what they need, what are they needs. And then we also always try to combine with traditional uh, or vernacular architecture or design so they can relate and it's not just seen as a like an, an alien um, landing in the in their life. So we took inspiration from this that I think the most smart barbecue ever made because it's a it's an outdoor kitchen, and so you put the fire in a different position depending on the direction of the wind. And then we took inspiration from them. They asked for something that could be divided in different program inside, but also has a kind of central space. So we used the uh, cross and also it's helped us to organize the landscape. Uh, the site is, um, it's an hectare, so it's 10,000 square meters. So we designed the cross and there was like kind of a small master plan uh, for future investment or development. In this case, we also have uh, collaborate with um, a, an, off, an engineering office in Italy for helping us to um, do the right calculation for the roof, because it was like um, a, a center was nine by nine meters, so kind of difficult to do it. And here is like the workshop how we start. So we always bring a container that then we reuse and retrofit for some other purpose, and here. We, set, we were set up the, setting up the, the tables for the beams and the pillars and so on. So those are, again, the carpenters, but then everybody's doing everything. And what is interesting, I mean, for us, maybe it's easier to understand, but then even the carpenter understood how difficult it is to build an orphanage or the house or how difficult it is to plan all the things. And at the same time, the architect understood how difficult it is to build a house that he was designing. So basically, as uh, difficult to say, I mean, to for us to understand, or sometimes we don't think, but we learn by or from mistakes. In in this kind of environment, you don't, you cannot fail many times. Otherwise, you don't, you get fired or you don't get the job. There's no ready job. So, what we trying to teach them or explain them that they can fail fail again, fail again, fail it better. So that's the main things of the, of the system, basically. So here, during the process, we were building, this is the team, these things, this portal, these gates, and then closing. Um, 
this is also interesting to see the challenges of what we're dealing with. I mean, there's many, uh, sometimes there's a, no power, but that doesn't mean that the construction doesn't go. So here we were to the Mike Steel, it was one of suppliers, and the guys just put by hand a beams of 10 meters on the truck. And those are some details and things that we were doing with them. Um, they were, of course, scared. They are scared to try to new things, scared to experiment, like Pedro said before. For them, the, I mean, the, the, um, the experience with bricks is just stretchable, so flat. But if you, I think everybody here in London, you can see the better example of how bricks can become something else. And here, just construction, again, it's the beauty of, it's not just the building itself, actually, it's not probably, but the most interesting thing is the process. We always also, women empowerment, so it's really interesting how you see during the fellowship, the, the people change completely, they bloom, they, 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 they open up, especially I remember here, the construction manager at a certain point was a, um, Amo was a girl, and she was super quiet before, then when she get the possibility to speak and actually to manage the construction site, she was super precise, super tough. And then they open a company together with other uh, guys. Of course here, it's also an example how we learn from by mistake, or from mistakes. Actually, they didn't measure the level of the ground very well. So we, when we, we've been on construction, I said, this doesn't look flat. I said, yeah, almost. Yeah, it's 1.2 meters out. <laughs> I said, oh, it's quite, quite, yeah. So we have, we, we changed, we adapted the, the design because we didn't, we didn't think to have a kind of an alley or corridor on the side, but then we need to fence it out because otherwise the guys could uh, fall out. But you know, I mean, normal challenge in everywhere, more or less. So from this project now, we, precisely measure the ground just off. Also because with timber, you know, it's easier to adapt it. You cannot stretch it, but you can cut it. With concrete would be quite uh, a problem. Um, so I just give back the, the words to Daniela to close up. Yeah, thank you. So basically, in our, um, you know, after we did these cohorts, we're now just finishing off our fourth cohort of In Loco Fellowships. Um, and we've been monitoring um, and evaluating the data to see, you know, does this concept, does this idea work? And we were very um, pleasantly sort of um, reassured, I, I guess, to see how, on average, monthly income um, for each of the fellows increased before COVID by over 56% um, every month. And then after COVID, it was about 43% um, from when before the fellowship to after the fellowship. Um, the other statistic we were really happy to see was on average, after three months of graduating, each fellow was generating jobs for another five people. Um, actually, the fellow who um, is in Malta at the moment employs 20 people now in his construction company. So this transformation of job seekers into job creators um, does seem to be working. And so collectively, they've created jobs for about 160 other people. And the way we, our strategy um, is how we grow is to remain a nimble, lean um, organization, but we can take on additional projects by referring them to the pioneers. So that way um, they get opportunities. They also can take on larger projects and we kind of fine tune um, our relationship with them depending on the complexity and the size of those projects. So up to now, we've been able to refer about 32, sorry, it's in, it's in, uh, it's in dollars, but um, what's that in pounds? It's about maybe uh, 28,000 um, pounds worth of, 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 of projects every year to the, to the fellows, which might not seem much. I mean, when we're here, we see the, comp the size of the projects, but in Lesotho, that's, that's quite a lot. Um, and it's great that they're getting those experience. So we, wanted to um, just show you, as I said, a six-minute video of our, um, our work so far, and that way you'll get to meet and see some of our other colleagues. And then we'd love to hear from you and take your questions and, and comments afterwards. So. 
I'm Daniela Guzman, the co-founder and executive director of RISE, which is Relationships Inspiring Social Enterprise. RISE is being co-founded with Bond Events, and the reason RISE is being set up is because of the lack of resources that are available to social entrepreneurs from low-income countries to access fundamental resources that they need, whether that's talent, skills, or funding. And here we are five years later, um, from a seed idea we've gone from strength to strength, training job seekers to become job creators, um, despite all the challenges that the world has thrown at us. We have trained over 50 entrepreneurs through our innovative design and build an entrepreneurship in loco fellowship program and after the fellows graduate through the program they become pioneers and we're now incubating over 30 businesses through that incubation program and our 50 fellows who have graduated from the in loco fellowship are now employing over 160 people therefore fighting um, poverty through enterprise. The RISE incubation program has equipped me with a lot of skills from finance to running um, a successful business but my biggest takeaway is is that architecture is not only about infrastructure but improving the lives of vulnerable communities as well. We've run four cohorts of In Loco Fellowships. In Loco is an innovative design, build and entrepreneurship training program transforming job seekers into job creators. We are also developing infrastructure and essential buildings and services for vulnerable communities who would otherwise not have access to such services. So therefore we are having an impact on two levels. On the one hand, vulnerable communities are getting much needed infrastructure development and at the same time, um, unemployed youth are getting much needed life skills and work experience and building their professional networks through the InLoco Fellowship. We've had the privilege of working with some incredible communities over the last five years. Um, we've worked with orphans and vulnerable children, um, starting with the God's Love Center uh, five years ago, which was our very first project, where children were living in very cramped conditions, sleeping on the floor, and they now have a beautiful home um, with also some income generating activities, including a computer lab and a grocery store. We've also worked with um, communities living with intellectual and physical disabilities. We've built Lesotho's first center for intellectual disabilities where children can now get um, diagnosed and also get proper training and life skills so that they can live to be independent um, citizens of society. Um, we've also assisted the Lesotho National Federation for Organizations for the Disabled who were desperately in need of a building that was fully accessible for people with all abilities and therefore it's now fully accessible for, for people in wheelchairs. We've also um, improved the lives of um, hundreds of children and infants and babies of factory workers who um, spend over 10 hours of their working day in the textile factories and these facilities now have playgrounds and toilets and um, nice beds and we did that in partnership with a local carpentry school so the students also got the much needed uh, work experience um, making all of these improvements from recycled products. We've also had um, incredible impact in rural communities um, where they were previously cut off from the outside world as they couldn't cross a dangerous river um, every time it rained or snowed and now those communities have access to essential services such as clinics and schools and, and markets. Our uh, young entrepreneurs design and build boreholes with running water, toilet facilities, school kitchens and food gardens with rainwater harvesting for the five hub schools who previously had no running water and extremely unhygienic pit latrine toilets which meant that adolescent girls couldn't even go to school during menstruation. Their everyday school lives are literally being transformed. We've also offered technical assistance for, uh, with the launch of a heritage and conservation program, looking at how we can preserve historical and culturally important um, buildings and infrastructure to, in order to make sure that they are conserved and preserved um, from, further, from further damage. And we've been working with youth on that program. So you might ask, what's next? 
We've just launched a research and innovation program to develop local, indigenous, sustainable and carbon neutral building materials that will help both the environment as well as the economy and create manufacturing jobs. At RISE, we believe that if you want to go fast, you should go alone. But if you want to go far, you should go together. We have this dream, a dream to build the very first enterprise hub in Lesotho. We've had this dream for quite a while because this is a much needed space for aspiring and startup entrepreneurs to ideate, to build and learn from each other. As you can imagine, we want to go far. As far as having the almost 40% youth unemployment rate in Lesotho reduced to zero. But we can only get there if you and us work together. We are at a point where we are so excited. We have been through this journey with you, everyone who's been with us from the beginning, through sharing a poster, social media engagement, on our LinkedIn, watched a lecture, been in a webinar, and just continuously been on our MailChimp and been giving to us for the past five years. So here's how you can help. It takes just $50 a month for three years to support an entrepreneur through our business incubation and training services. And remember that for every fellow that's trained and for every entrepreneur that's developed, on average they create jobs for about five other people within three months of completing the program. So just think about the impact that your $50 or 50 euros a month can have on vulnerable youth, unemployed youth in developing countries such as Lesotho. Or you can volunteer to become a business mentor for a young entrepreneur in Lesotho. Just express your interest on info at riseint.org. We are so excited because for the first time since our inception in 2017, we are a fully led Basutu organization. So thank you, our supporter. It's been an amazing five years. Here's to the next five and please do keep following what Rise does. Thank you. And that um, film was produced by one of our pioneers, Ritza Pillow, who's an incredible young architect and graphic designer and video producer who's actually got a scholarship to come and study at Bartlett, um, starting yet to defer by a year because he's still fundraising for his um, living costs here in London. But um, yeah, that's, um, that's it. So just some areas in which you can get involved. You know, we do encourage you to please sign up to our um, social media channels and, and newsletters. Um, if you're interested in being mentoring some of the youth, um, you can sign up to be a mentor as well. And we also run international workshops. So if any of you want to come and spend 10 days or two weeks, normally we got feedback that 10 days was too short. So two weeks um, seems to be the perfect time. We'll be running another one in April and one in August. So you're very welcome to, um, to sign up for that. And maybe we can partner on a particular project. So this is our first time really presenting in, in London. So we're open to ideas and suggestions. And, um, and yeah, look forward to hearing your comments. So we've got this beautiful... Um, speaker box which we can I guess throw around um, and would love to hear yeah any anything you may be learned from today any questions that you may have any comments about any of our work um, or anything that you've seen thank you don't be shy <laughs> and I think we've got people online as well right who can also um, type in so I don't know where where you guys are but um, look forward to seeing you as well <laughs> Deathly silence. Anyone try to do concrete by hand? <laughs> I believe me, it's the hardest thing yeah. ever. <laughs> ever. That's... As an architect, um, I think it's it's an it's an exchange also how we 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 try. I mean, we try to train others, but also how a lot. As an architect, as uh, we both as our um, office in here in Europe, in Lisbon and Milan, how we learn on construction by doing things by ourselves. We also learn a lot by the mistakes that we do. So construction is the proof of the design. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not, or you need to adapt. And it's it's all a part of the process that we try to uh, give to them. So we as we said we also organize a lot of uh, or during the project also international uh, workshop where 
student, your architect or not, comes to uh, have an experience, of course. It's also interesting to know different cultures and countries, but also to have an experience on gets dirty a lot. <laughs> um, and learn or test it, the knowledge that we have on how to do a nice, beautiful chest, but then if you have to build by yourself, it's quite challenging, even a table. Uh, we don't have ceiling machine, of course, uh, CNC machines, but um, everything became a challenge, but everything became also inspiring and helps a lot to um, develop our skills or how to uh, take all the, the problems. There are not problems, I, let's say there's no problems, there's different solutions <laughs> to that uh, kind of challenge. Um, I think this was, oh, where? <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you I so sketch. much for uh, such an inspiring presentation. And I was wondering if you could say a bit more, uh, something more about the relationship building, the initial one, because from my own experience of doing participatory workshops uh, with communities, I know that it's very difficult to convince them of your good intentions when you come from the outside. So, yeah, if you could just speak to that. Okay. So, Part of, the, um, part of the reason we went to Lesotho is uh, we had already established a, a reputation in Lesotho. Um, Daniela had been the, um, the CEO or the director of Kick for Life for a long time. And that's a small organization, but it has a huge impact because it went in through uh, football. And eventually, it's now changed, but it ended up even having a team in the Premier League locally. Uh, not in our time before, and I had been working for Prince Harry's charity in Lesotho also for, for quite a bit of time. So when we went back, um, we were people that in general people trusted, and because of the communities, uh, these two organizations worked with a lot of smaller partner communities that were really grassroots based. Mm -hmm. It was easy for people to trust where we were coming from. And the fact that we never did and we never ran a, a single participatory design workshop without the fellows involved, there was also uh, the engagement in their own language. Most of the people that work with us speak English, but the communities we engage with don't. So um, uh, I, I have a background uh, from, from the UK here in participatory design, and I did a course at, uh, at Oxford Brooks just about uh, development work. So a lot of the techno techniques and methods we use have been distilled from work of people like Nabil Hamdi down to something that's very implementable and that we've created manuals around it and we train our local guys in, in doing that. And then the, the experience that we just had collectively as a team has helped us do that. But without the local people doing the most of the engagement, we wouldn't be able to get anywhere. And also, um, other than the first project, which is um, one that we proactively went out um, to um, to talk to and say, look, we're, would you like to partner with us? Um, after that, every single project we've done, the, we have been approached. Um, so people have actually come to us. And we've got a long list of, of a waiting list of other projects because um, to do our work, you need the three key things. You need um, land, clear title of land, which is often harder to get than one would imagine. You need funding and then you, you need the right social impact project. Um, so all those three ingredients need to be in place. Um, and uh, often funding is not available. So we have, you know, a, a long waiting. So people come to us. They like our approach. We, the fact that we are very much community driven. Um, and then, you know, we understand the dynamics to make sure that all the key stakeholders, um, the local chiefs, um, the appropriate ministries and local councils, and then the, the geographical communities are, are then invited as well. So that also is is the dynamics that that starts off those projects on that right um, footing. Yeah, that's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to thank. It's community driven, but also the fact they are all scared. I mean, as you a foreign approach you, you are not so open and immediately. But the fact that as we get dirty on the fact that we we build things with them, uh, we prove them, uh, and the guys also help us. And the fact that you just listen sometimes instead of doing something. Yeah, sometimes it's good just to listen. And then in some critical or developing countries or critical communities, it's also difficult to find someone that listens to your needs then what we do is try to understand what the wish and the needs. For GLC, it was 
interesting and fun because we, of course, we ask to everyone what they want or what they wish. And of course, it comes out, we want a pool. But then when you ask to the, to the community that was sitting like you and said, okay, so we might get the pool at a certain point, but you want a pool or, you, or a toilet now? And everybody, even the kids, they say, say okay, no, start with the toilet. So it's like a kind of an approach. You listen, you don't say no, or it's, you do open questions. You kind of open without be naive to say that they're going to design what, what they dream. But we try to shape the needs, but as I think everybody do it, uh, in a way that you listen and then you do. You do with them, basically. So they always part of a challenge or the part of a process anyway. So at the beginning start with few, but then after weeks or something on the second meeting, the, the, yeah, people are coming uh, happily, I would say. Any other questions? <laughs> I'm kind of interested in your, um, it's great. Presentation, by the way, thank you for that. Um, how you actually transfer the practical, physical skills to make stuff? Because uh, it's something where you tend to find if you're trying to teach somebody how to use a saw or a hammer or lay bricks, you tend to do it and they watch. And there's a moment when you've got to let them do it. And I, I just was interested to hear whether there are any complications in that sort of transfer of practical skills and from your experience yeah. we haven't lost any limbs yet which is a good thing uh, but we've had uh, we've had some co some close calls um, we've had to do a lot of and we've had to learn through that process um, at the beginning when we started out we we had this idea of uh, putting everything in place, health and safety officers, everything. And then we've grown through that and we've developed some partnerships with the health and safety training college to do that. And we, we literally let people use hammers that have never used hammers before. Um, Luca and I both share a passion, uh, a common passion about the fact that architects should build. It's something we've, we've shared for a very long time. Uh, I think both of our first projects were, were us getting dirty and, and doing them. And that led to the process of, of allowing people with no experience whatsoever in construction to, to build. Um, yeah, no, but it's, you do with them. Of course, you show them. I mean, it's if to hammer and nail is not very difficult. You maybe show how to do things with a timber's construction. We showed them before how to use the, the saw machine just to be careful. But of course, the fact that we always have a brick layers definitely knows much better how, and fast how to lay brick. That is also very difficult, precise job, doesn't look like, but is it? Then they teach the others. And then the carpenter knows how to use the hammer and the saw and teach the others. So, and there's also plumbers and electricians. So we, we don't know everything. Everybody knows something, so we put it together. And anyway, as we said before, we let them do some mistakes. So we are actually we would not allow to extend the construction side, but it's always happened. Also, because for for example in GLC, a certain moment I was doing I don't know maybe welding, do something else, and then a guy's called me, and I got to check the the walls from the I mean from the scaffolding, and the the wall looks like a Zaha did things, and they <laughs> say, wow, that's a good achievement, but the doors doesn't fit anymore now. And so I say, so what we do is say, well, we knock it down and then we do it straight again. And the thing is, I was not pissed because it was a banana wall. I was pissed like, why did you just call me now that we finished? We should have, I mean, you should say it before. So that's the things when I say that are not, they are afraid to fail. And then say, okay, knock it down. We do it again. Then we we'll extend another week. It's fine. But that's how we do it. I mean, you learn from mistakes. Then you learn that probably you didn't use, they, sometimes you do fast, you don't use the level, you don't do the fish line or whatever, like we don't have laser. Fortunately, she didn't buy for us yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was on a wish list for Christmas, let's see this year. <laughs> but after, but at least we, last year, uh, she brought the, the concrete machine. 
the concrete mixer because I'm getting too old to mix by hand again, so she bought those things. <laughs> so just to add on that is also every year we are building the capacity of the local team. So we are basically always trying to work our way out of a job. Um, so the more um, the, the fellows see their own um, peers learning the skills and and we're you know transferring that skills and knowledge and experience so our site managers now who are leading the process were um, fellows in the first you know first cohort second cohort so also that is really really impactful when young people see other young basutu training them rather than um, you know foreigners so that's also yeah something that's very important in our model and in our ongoing plan I just want to add something to that, which is not necessarily part of the answer to this question. But one thing we're also very proud of is um, Rise International is is the initial organization that was found, uh, that was created. And then we have Rise Lesotho, which is the one that operates in Lesotho, which has now been handed over and is fully run by Basotho people. Um, and it's also pretty much self-sufficient in terms of funding. So we developed the the organization as a social enterprise which might have failed to, to pass that message on earlier. And so we don't rely hugely on, on big grants or donors. Uh, we, we are actually selling design services um, as, as an architectural practice down there. So with some guidance from oh, us, by, the, by them, yeah. So they design, they do all the, the work, and we hold like um, an advisory role to guide them in that design process to try and keep the standard to something that's bearing on our original name um, as an organization. Next Pritzke is going to be in Lesotho for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a banana wall. <laughs> so if, if it's a, a social enterprise and you're not completely um, dependent on funding, then what's the, um, um, what's the strategy for, for expanding? Is there any bottleneck in terms of funding or, or, or how does that look? Yeah, I'll, I'll cut. <laughs> so, um, with a social enterprise, while well, you strive to generate funding, so for example, Kick for Life, eight years on, um, generates seventy percent of its funding through the hotel and restaurant, which is the the projects that we had worked on. So it's um, it's we're not a hundred percent, you know, self uh, funded, but. Um, so we do need some, so for example, some projects there's funding for it and others there isn't. So we are generating surplus to build reserves to pay towards those projects. Um, and the bottleneck is um, we can only grow as much as the funds that are available. As I said, you know, we could be doing more projects simultaneously, um, but they don't have the, the funds to be done. Um, also, we've been approached, you know, while, by World Bank to take this model into agriculture sector to expand into other sectors um, because, you know, it's, it's working, the local sort of methodology. Um, but again, that requires uh, funding to do that. So, yes, while we... Um, we self-fund to do a lot of the project work, and we want to make sure that we keep our overheads to, you know, to the minimum, so that we then don't become uh, a heavy machine where we have to raise so much just to cover our overheads. That's why our strategy to growth is to remain lean as an organisation, but then work with our our pioneers to take on additional um, projects. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Hi. Um... Yeah, so some of the criticism on sustainable development, I've, I, I feel like you've um, discussed already. Um, do you train the mentors at all to deal with local knowledge and local technique and all of that? Because you don't, you don't want to impose other ideals. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, with our mentorship program, we have a briefing for mentors and we also look at what your reasoning is to be a mentor. Um, we obviously, we also have a, lo a lot of local mentors as well. But there's certain things, you know, whether it's um, how you address a particular problem or project, we've got a lot of um, very instinctive ways of doing things that as a result of our upbringing, of our education, um, that we just take for granted, you know, our problem solving skills, for example. Um, and that is quite a challenge for, um, for, for Basutu. So, yes, we do, we do have an interview to see what, 
you know, your motivation is and also cultural sensitivity and, you know, what is the role of a mentor? We, we do that briefing and then we have a goal setting framework that you put together with the mentee. So we try and also match make the mentor and mentee um, and put a time frame on it and what measures are going to be put in place to measure the how the mentorship is going. And, you know, and then it could be for a specific project or characteristic or behavior that the mentee is looking to develop. Um, and then they need a mentorship from, from somebody else. So it's, it's you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing. But yes, we do monitor because obviously you've got language, culture, um, time zones, all of those, uh, those challenges. Yeah, so learning both ways. Both ways, absolutely. Yes, for sure, for That's sure. Things that we didn't show because... It's, it's not related to architecture, but what, as an organization, we do, we organize monthly um, a conference, a webinar, and we used to, I don't know if we do a video like a movie or night, where we show like documentaries, um, TED talk. We basic everything is online mostly, but it's, and also we give for granted that if you have internet and a smartphone, then you know what to search. But if you don't know what to search for, even if you do in a Trinity College library, uh, it's like you don't know how to read. So we, what we try to do parallel to the project is like to create a kind of a cultural, it's not even movement, but like to give, to expose the, the, the youngest, the young entrepreneurs to uh, a diff critical thinking, different environments, mostly try to show them that not just because unfortunately we are white, so there's always kind of a distance in the beginning, but show them, show them example in the continent where young entrepreneurs locally made it. So business uh, or uh, companies, or show them that there are construction done with a vernacular or sustainable material that actually works better or are cheaper than others. Because, of course, if you tell why we don't do it in mud, they say, I don't want in mud, I want in concrete block. But then it's super cold. So we show them there are other examples, as everybody has, I think, has an example in the university or in the background. So we, we show them there is a word. And it's also silly to say, but in a landlocked country, as Pedro explained before, depended completely from South Africa. If they shut everything, they shut the information, they shut materials, they shut everything. So they are really constrained from what they see. So if the building there would be a pyramid, they just keep doing a pyramid all the time because they don't have possibility, the chance, the chance to, to see other things around and say, oh, maybe the square is actually better than a triangle. So that's how also we work parallel to this fellowship. There's a lot of training beside the architectural or building environment, let's say. I think it's time. Yes. Thank you. So, no, thank you so much. I think the, the, the thing I like the most about uh, what I, I was with them, I was with them last summer. Um, they told me I didn't work much, but uh, I actually did. Um, no, it's interesting. The experience was amazing from uh, from from a, a lot of standpoints, and I've learned uh, I've learned a lot. Um, hard to describe uh, and to introduce you, uh, but as you've seen, uh, what uh, you make tangible, you make tangible what architecture can leave behind beyond architecture. Like most of the infrastructure that is left behind by their work is immaterial, is knowledge, uh, is community. Um, while we were in, uh, in Lesotho, uh, we went to visit, we had the opportunity to go to a university, see some students. And uh, one of our friends, um, Alberto, made this uh, small lecture and um, <clears throat> it was titled, uh, building empathy. And I think that describes it better than anything else. So thank you so much. And uh, let's think of how we can continue to help and support. Thank you. Thanks.